Welcome back. I'm Dr. John Oldham, Chief of Staff at the Menninger Clinic, and welcome back to our series of podcasts that we call Menninger Mindscape. We have a very interesting guest today, Dr. Romero Salas. Romero, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Romero is in our Department of Psychiatry here at Baylor College of Medicine and is one of our key scientists uh, who's helping us with our research project. I don't know how many of you had a chance to see the other podcast that uh, Dr. Chris Fowler and I did, but Chris is another um, one of our researchers. And we talked there, but if you didn't see it, I just want to go over it briefly about a project that we are carrying out called MindMB. That's an acronym that stands for the McNair Initiative for Neuroscience Discovery at Menninger and Baylor. And McNair stands for the McNair Foundation. We're very grateful to them for their support. We also get support from the Board of Directors of Menninger Clinic and from the Department of Psychiatry at Baylor. Pooling those together has enabled us to design a very interesting research project. And one really important part of that is our brain imaging component. And Romero is our lead scientist helping us with that. And there's some really interesting parts to that. Tell us about it. So within the Mind and Bee project, we have this incredible opportunity to have a, a lot of standardized clinical data that probably Chris Fowler talked about. And we have the opportunity to get uh, genetic data from all these from all these patients. And on top of that, we can build a big library of MRI uh, characteristics of each one of these patients. So what happens to a patient when he comes into the Camry? The Camry is at Baylor, the, the Center for Advanced MRI. So, uh, so, so, uh, so let's pretend I'm a patient. I'm coming right. to the Camry, the imaging center. At ba so, at so the first thing is uh, somebody's going to joke about the Camry is better than a Corolla. But then after that, <laughs> okay. you know, we make first we make sure it's safe to scan you, so you don't have any piece of metal inside your body and things like that. And after that, you once you understand what's going to happen, you go into an MRI. So it's a big tube. You go like this. You enter the MRI with a mirror in front of your face. And we do five separate experiments in, in one sitting. So it takes about an hour. The whole thing takes about an hour. Yes, the whole, you're going to be inside the MRI for about an hour. Okay. So uh, the first thing we do is uh, just a very nicely detailed anatomy of each brain. That is just a series of pictures um, on, a, on, on a very nicely detailed so we can see the, each, the anatomy, and, and there's things that you can analyze on that uh, on, for example, how big your prefrontal cortex is, if you have a condition versus another, and things like that. So once we have that, that takes about five minutes to get the anatomy. We have another anatomical uh, sequence that we do, which is called DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, which is uh, somebody very smart discovered that you can label the water in a, each part of the brain with magnetism. So you magnetize the water, you label that, those waters, you wait and, and let it move just a tiny bit, and then take a picture of where the water that I just labeled is now. Boy, I do agree with you. Somebody very smart figured yeah, that out. <laughs> it's great. It's just, just amazing technology and that you do with the same machine that you use in, a, in an MRI in a hospital. And, and what happens is, let's say this is a piece of your brain, which we call a voxel, a volume pixel, right? So if there's um, fibers, if there's white matter running this way, for example, the water has an easy time moving like this, but it won't run through the nerve because the nerves are, are all full of fat. So the water doesn't move like this, it moves like that. And if, if you, since we are able to label the water and see how it moves, now we can say, oh, in this piece of the brain, in this millimeter of the brain, the nerves tend to go this way. And in the next one, tend to go this way. So you, you can trace them. And what you end up with is these beautiful pictures of where all the fibers of the brain are in this particular person. And, so, and so fibers means nerve fibers, which means kind of networks and how they connect. Right, right, exactly. So these are the axons that many axons together of many neurons go from one place to another. And we all have the same anatomy, the same types of fibers, right? 
and they've been named since Ramon y Cajal, but how strong they are, how big they are, exactly how many connections you have between those two areas is variable. Mm -hmm. And we are starting to understand how it can be impacted by psychiatric okay. issues. So that's the second thing we do. It takes 12 minutes. Okay. And we end up with all these fibers that you can pseudo color and, and, and it, it, you end up with these beautiful red, green, and yellow pictures. I, I've seen some of them. They're, they're really cool. Yeah, they're really cool. Uh, <laughs> but what is important is what we do after that. What is important are all the numbers we can get from those cool pictures. So the pictures are beautiful, but uh, what we're interested in is how many fibers can we measure, mm -hmm. how long they are between you know, the ones that go through this particular area of the brain. So that's the second thing we do. And then we do three functional uh, sets of images. And a, and a functional image, what it is, is we take uh, a whole volume of the brain. So it, it's a series of pictures that cover the whole brain. That takes about two seconds to get the whole brain. So the resolution is not great because we have to take it very fast. We have to take many sections in two seconds. So the resolution is not great, but we have this one brain, and sec two seconds later, next brain, and two seconds later, next brain. So if you are in the MRI and we're collecting this data, and an event happens, we might be able to tell which area of the brain is activated by this event, because the intensity of gray that you see in each area of the brain has to do with the activity of that area in that particular moment. So, 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 if, so if I'm in the machine and you instruct me to do something or think something or say something, my term, uh, a certain part of the brain will light up. Exactly. Okay. Yes. And, and light up is good because we can color these things in the end. You, you, you've seen these pictures of a, a section of a brain that has some area that is yellow. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's yellow. We color yellow the area where the numbers say this area has been activated. Right. Right. So uh, the experiment we do is with tiny bits of juice. So we offer a couple of uh, sweet juice. Sometimes it's iced tea with peach. That's uh, one of the favorites we have. Right. Or a lemonade or something. So we put that juice in a syringe that is connected to a computer that in a very long non-metallic tube goes into the mouth of the patient that is inside the scanner. So remember I said you have a mirror in front of your face. So we show a cue in the mirror. It's a yellow ball that hard to miss. And we use that kind of as a timer. We can tell, oh, the brain is seeing something because this area on the back is activating whenever we turn on the light. So that's our, our timer for us mm -hmm. to see. That's an event that happens. And we also, once in a while, we'll push the syringe, goes zzzz, and a tiny bit of juice goes into your mouth. Mm -hmm. And since it's sweet, your brain knows that this is good. <laughs> right. so, so as soon as you receive the juice, it's just a tiny bit, enough to, to, to taste the sweetness, then you swallow normally. But what happens is, right after receiving the juice, the reward areas of your brain light up. OK, so it looks at reward circuitry. It looks at the reward circuitry. And we know from, from years and years and years of experiments in, in all kinds of models you can imagine how the reward circuitry works. And we know the, the molecular underpinnings of, of reward circuitry. So which are the receptors, which are the neurons, which are the neurotransmitters and the receptors and, and, and the different parts of the brain that the reward system works. So all that we know, I would say, well. But what we can do now with this, with this project is, how is the reward circuit uh, modified or impacted by each one of the problems that might uh, make a person be here in at Manninger Clinic? Okay. So for example, we know that uh, in addiction, the reward circuitry is, is very much impacted. Yeah, sure. So, one of the things we're trying to do now is since we have this huge population that abuse different drugs, we can start comparing those things and see whether different parts of the reward circuitry are impacted the same or differently by each one of these drugs of abuse. And, and would you also then be able to look to see if there are differences between 
groups of patients, some of whom have the same kind of addictive problem, let's say alcohol problem, exactly, but have different other things. Exactly, and, and, and that's one of the beautiful things of this project is that thanks to the support that you just mentioned, uh, we are going to be able to keep scanning uh, people and, and create a huge database. Usually in most, there, there's thousands of, of imaging experiments uh, published. And usually what we do is we take these two populations, uh, 20 healthy controls that do not abuse drugs, never been depressed, they're great, they're perfectly healthy. And then we look and what do you want to study? Um, cocaine addiction. Mm -hmm. So we will look for 20 cocaine dependent people that do not really abuse anything else, mm -hmm. that are not depressed, that have not, never been in any other kind of problem except this. So we compare those two things. Right, and right. that's great because it can tell us, well, and in this case, the reward system is modified this and that way. Right. But the chances of a psychiatrist seeing a patient like that in a clinic are very low, like, right? Most patients that are going to have addiction to this and that drug, plus depression, plus some other problems that they have during their life that might be might impact, right? PTSD, mm -hmm. TBI, You're there's right. all these things. Right. So if we collect enough patients, if our database is big enough, then we're gonna say, well, we have uh, this patient and this, and these two here and this, and we can fish those out and create a very, very detailed group and say, well, these are cocaine addicts that are actually depressed, but they don't have anxiety problems right. and et cetera. And we, we have that little group, and if there are maybe 20 patients or so, we can use those to compare. And, and that's, we're, we're, that's the road we're going down, because we're able here with enough time, but um, it's predictable. We're going to have big numbers. Right, yes. Because we have a lot of patients who really need help, who are coming here on a regular basis. And almost all of them who aren't disqualified because of metal in their body or things like that, are interested to participate. Now, I'm going to get us going too, too long because we don't have much time. So um, I want to just jump to the one other thing that you mentioned. There's one other piece of the protocol. So I'm, if I'm the patient, I'm still in the scanner. Yes, I'm you're still in the scanner. I'm happy because you, you gave me some sweet juice. Yeah, juice, so is, juice is over. <laughs> there's, there's two more things that we do. One, it's called the cyber ball. You'll be playing a social game, which is a, most simple thing we can think of. There's three players that are connected through the computer. So you are going to be uh, the yellow player, and there's a red, and there's somebody who's the blue player. And there's one ball, and you just pass the ball through the players. Okay. That's all you do. There's no points. You don't win. You don't lose. But you are in a social situation. You're passing the ball to the right or to the left. Mm -hmm. You receive, and you give the ball. And what we so those are all events that happen while we are measuring which area of the brain is being active, mm -hmm. right? So we can measure how is it, I mean, there's many things we can measure. One is how is it being in a social situation versus no social situation, which just happened. And then how is it to receive the ball versus to give the ball mm -hmm. versus they're passing the ball among themselves. Mm -hmm. So all these are three different kinds of events mm -hmm. If we collect enough of those, we can analyze which area of the brain is responsible or um, signals each one of those events, right? So what we have chosen, given the, the limited time, we can have you in an hour in, in the scanner, but not much longer because the, you, know, you, you want to get out eventually. So we, we've chosen uh, reward and social uh, behavior mm -hmm. as two things that are very, very critical for psychiatry. Right. And there's, right. there's, of course, um, I would add uh, cognitive experiments, but we really don't have time for yeah, that. Right. And we might do that next, next you know, right. in the next five years. But these will be very interesting to see what we learn from, because these are critical. Social interaction right. is a critical part of one's life, and it's a critical area where a lot of our patients have trouble. Mm -hmm and also addictive problems and, and seeking rewards is another. So these are really high priorities. Right, and depression. So depression also goes to the reward system. Sure, sure. Right, and, and you know, that's a big, big, big population, depression and addiction and the comorbidity. And a lot of our so. patients are here for depression that just hasn't responded very well. So if we learn a little bit about 
Exactly. What's special about the brains of these and, patients? And, and what is special about each type of depression you might have, yeah. right? Because not all, not all depressions are the same, and we, and we know that. But uh, we need to, we go back again to the, if we have a huge population, like huge database, then we might start looking specifically for the different characteristics of depression and say, well, the people who's depressed but have this problem, this particular problem, that is manifested in this area of the brain. So if I'm participating in this, of course, I sign my consent to do this at the beginning, and I'm told that it's not something that's necessarily going to benefit my treatment mm -hmm. while I'm here. Yeah. But I do get a little present to go home with, which is a take-home <laughs> image yes. of my own brain. Is that right? Yes. It's not an image. It's a series. It's a, it's a volume. So, so the, the, what we do at the very beginning, uh, the structure, the, ana the detailed anatomy, mm -hmm. We just burn a CD with those images that you can see in any computer, and you get uh, a series uh, of slices of your brains, in which you can see it actually as a movie. Oh, that's my nose, those are my eyes, that's my... So you don't really see your nose, but you see the interior part of, of all your head. So um, it's that, not really that useful, no, I but it's a, very I cool, it's a very cool gift. Yeah, and actually, um, a neurologist can use it. So our mm -hmm. images, and, and this happens incredibly rarely, fortunately, but uh, we, we kind of go through the images to make sure things are okay and things like that. And, and uh, once in a while we see something that, I mean, I, I'm not a neurologist, so I'm not qualified to say, oh, he, this person has a tumor or has something. So whenever we see something that is like, I haven't seen before, uh, I call yeah. a friend and yeah. say, hey, would you look at this yeah. brain? And I would say four out of five, she says, this is nothing. And once over maybe four years that we've been doing these and other similar experiments, uh, we, we called somebody and, and told them, well, I think we should go see a doctor. Well, but but, for but, that one patient, that That's, might be useful. That might be very helpful. Yeah. Well, we could talk a whole lot longer, but we don't have more time. But this is really interesting. I'm probably going to ask you to come back at some point later on uh, when we're a little when farther. When our database is bigger and, and we know more things. Right. We're <laughs> farther down the road, uh, but it's really exciting. Thank you very much for coming thanks. and telling us about this. My pleasure. Good. And thanks to all of you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time.